Okay, so, so far we spoke about how um, information is sensed uh, from the body and transformed uh, from sensation to some perception and some internal model of the world. We spoke about how we allocate attention to different aspects of the world surrounding us and how we can focus on some things and, and reject other types uh, of stimuli uh, and sort of track events in the world this way. What I want to do today is I want to talk about uh, once we perceive something and we turn it into a mental representation, how do we hold on to it so that uh, we can hold on to it over time? And maybe we can use it later for you know, thinking or for some kind of behavior. In other words, today I want to talk about memory. What do I mean by memory in the words of uh, Tolving is the means by which we retain and draw on past experience in order to use the information in the present. And now there's several really interesting aspects uh, to memory. For example, encoding, which is really the process of, of bringing, of once information is in, how do we process it? And, and how does our brain mark information so that it can be kept and then at the later time um, used or retrieved, as we say? Uh, and then how do we store information? So how can information is, how is it kept once it's in, once it's encoding, how is it kept inside our minds over time for potentially the rest of our lives? Um, then a third aspect is that of retrieval. So a long time has passed since you sensed something and since you perceived it and made a, a mental representation of let's say an event. Um, 20 years have passed and uh, you want to think back to something you've learned and you try to dig out from your mind that memory. How do you do that? How do you open all the drawers of, of memory and find the one that you're interested in? And finally, the last process, forgetting. It has happened probably to all of us that there's something that we've, we've tried to remember, we've tried to, uh, we've tried to pull out from uh, the drawers of memory, and, uh, and we were unable to. And a really fascinating question is, is this because the memory has washed away? Is it just no longer there? Or were we just unable to use the, to, to go find the exact drawer in which we stored that particular memory? Now there's several aspects uh, to memory. We often refer to sensory memory, which is really the first stage. It's, 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 a, it's a sensory specific form of memory. For example, you're seeing something, it's suddenly gone from in front of you, and you still might have the feeling for, a, for an instant that that thing is still, that object is still right there in front of you, known as iconic memory. Um, um, and this seems to be a type of memory that, that can accept a large amount of information, but it's, it also fades very quickly. Then we often talk about short-term memory, and this is the ability to hold on to a memory for a brief amount of time. Just about, imagine me telling you a telephone number um, so that you can then walk to your phone, pick it up and dial it. Sort of that, sort of we're talking about this general amount of time. So it's really a, a, short, um, a short period of time. And this seems to be a bottleneck in a sense, uh, because you can only hold on, as we will see, so much information in short-term memory. And then from there, some information will make it into long-term memory, um, which is uh, sort of a, a much longer uh, store in terms of time. And this holds uh, long-term memory, can, can, can store an unknown amount of um, information. It's unclear how much information can be stored inside the brain. Um, and potentially it stores information from, you know, some span of 20 minutes, 10 minutes, um, potentially for the rest of your life. Um, and indeed, um, you know, we all have memories from early, very early in, in our life, uh, which are in our long-term memory. And of course, each of these is, is very important and, and they all need to function in order for memory and for, for things that we have encoded and that we have embedded in our mind in order to then be able to successfully encode them and then whenever needed, retrieve them so that we can use them for, you know, for further processing, thinking and, and behaving 
uh, the, all these aspects need to be able to work together. And there are many other, um, there are many interesting aspects um, to study in memory. Obviously, there's a question of capacity, just how much memory, um, how much information can be held uh, in memory. Uh, there's a question of duration, for how long can you hold on to a memory in each of these systems. Um, and of course, there's a question of format. Uh, once the memory is brought in, and it starts as a sensory memory, so it starts in a specific format, but how do we hold on to it? Short-term memory. So sensory memory uh, has the format of the specific sense we're referring to. Uh, you might have the experience that somebody talks to you, and, and maybe you're not exactly listening, but, but, that, but, but the sound is somehow remaining in your ear for a moment. Uh, in fact, to the point that you can even you can even access it. You might have experienced uh, somebody talking to you, and uh, you're busy doing something else, and they say, "Ah, you're not listening to me," uh, and then you you just repeat the last you know few words that they said uh, as a proof that you are actually listening. The truth is that that's just echoic memory. Um, it's the your auditory memory um, that was just still keeping alive the message that came in, despite the fact that you were initially not attending to it. Um, so that is the case for sensory memory, but once it comes in into short-term memory and then again in long-term memory, how is it stored? What is the format? To give you one example, visual information, is it actually stored for the long-term as visual information or is it stored in some other format? Now, as you might be well aware, memory is often compared to something like a video camera, at least in common parlance. Uh, and it is generally thought to be in some kind of uh, some accurate recording of the events, uh, whatever sort of you're, you're perceiving, um, so that uh, later on at another you know, later point in time, you can actually go back and load uh, that you know, DVD inside your mind and inspect whatever were the contents of that particular memory. And if you've got a really good memory, you can even say enhance and then you will see in greater detail whatever bit of memory uh, you're trying to retrieve. And, and this is very common in our culture. Um, uh, just to give you a few examples, you, you, you might remember that many of the protagonists um, of many TV shows do tend to have um, outstanding memory capacities, often referred to as uh, eidetic memory, incorrectly. Uh, I think they're typically, they mean photographic memory, which is a slightly different older related concept. But you might remember that in Suits, the main, one of the main characters has a photographic memory, which is what makes this particular character interesting. You'll remember that the delightfully annoying Sheldon Cooper of the Big Bang Theory has an eidetic memory. Again, uh, I think what they meant is photographic memory. And if you've ever seen the, the wonderful TV show Unforgettable, um, the whole plot is again based on the idea that the main character um, cannot forget. And so she has this, uh, this wonderful gift of memory. And if you ask people, if you ask them, you know, is it the case that human memory is a bit like a video camera and just accurately records the events you see in here um, so that you can later on inspect them? If you ask the general public, uh, so over 60% of them would say, yeah, absolutely, that's, that's how memory works. So it's very obvious that in our common, um, in our popular culture, uh, memory is seen much like, um, you know, some form of, um, of video recording apparatus. If you ask experts, however, the picture is very different. In fact, virtually all would disagree with this statement. Um, if you ask people, you know, once you have recorded an event and once you have it in memory, is it, is it there? Is it crisp? Does it, does it ever get changed? And interestingly, just about, you know, close to 50% of people will say, yep, yeah, that, that's it. Uh, memory, um, once it's encoded, it's encoded, it's there, and I can access it later, and, and what I'm accessing is uh, the thing that was uh, encoded earlier. So again, if you ask um, experts, they will say that that is definitely not the case. And, and really here, I'm foreshadowing what will be a central theme um, of, um, of this section uh, of this class. And it's the idea that memory, much like perception, um, is again an inferential process. Uh, the sense 
I mean for memory in particular, is that memory is not something that you, you know, you burn on the DVD and then you store it away and then you pull it out and look at it. And, and it's, it's exactly what you saw at the time that you encoded that memory. But memory is reconstructive. In fact, as we will see, it turns out that we form memories, but every time we have to go back and fish that memory, it, it is susceptible to being slightly changed. And, and it gets changed from all sorts of things, from the way in which we're asked to retrieve that memory, from our thoughts, our desires, the things we like, the things we don't like. So memory, once again, is a reconstructive process. It's not an exact copy of the things that we perceive and that we experience. And, and see, when you bring this to its uh, uh, sort of, when you take, take a couple uh, more steps and you think of the implications of how we view memory and how memory actually is, um, you start going in the domain, for example, of um, in the legal system. Uh, as you might know, again, in common culture, uh, if, some, if there is a, an eyewitness of an event, that is a very strong form of substantiation. Um, you know, if somebody says, oh, I recognize that um, jacket, face, car, whatever it might be, uh, we do tend to believe them. And if you ask people again, surprisingly, at least 40% of the people do think that um, a, an eyewitness account is sufficient to, to get to, to a ruling. Once again, if you ask experts, they will say that is not the case. And in fact, in, in, in our department in psych here at UCLA, we have uh, Professor Alan Castell, uh, who's particularly interested in many aspects of memory uh, and meta memory, but including things such eyewitness, eyewitness testimonies. 